Good morning, Life Center. Turn around and give somebody a high five. How many of y'all know that Jesus can change lives? Come on, somebody. Amen. My name is Andrew. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm so happy to be here this morning with you. Welcome to Life Center. If you're a first-time visitor, guest of ours, we welcome you. Thank you. Let's give him a hand. Come on. Yeah. If you're online, welcome. Hopefully you can hear everything good. Sometimes it gets squirrely online. It's good online, but better in the house, right? Yeah. Amen. It's great to see you guys this morning. And this is when we, when we like to worship with our giving. Jesus was talking about it, and he said, where your treasure is, your heart is. I don't know about you, my heart isn't always at work. But my heart surely gets happy when the digits show up on Friday in my bank. <laughs> right? So there's something connected to that, to that monetary means. It's how we support ourselves. It's how we prepare and provide for our families. And I was thinking this morning in this room, the lives that have been changed by the grace of Jesus. Just people's stories that I get to know of how Jesus just reached down, pulled them out, love. I think there's something special when we sing that song, Let Me Tell You About My Jesus, because so many of us in this room just identify with just let me tell you what he's done. So when we bring our tithes and our offerings, monetary action of worship, we're sowing into God's economy, into God's kingdom. And it's, it's like providing for our extended family. We're getting to bless lives and bless people and see God do things in people's lives and get to be a part of it. So that is why we consider this time of giving as worship, right? Because we're giving from a blessed heart, from a blessed life. And it's not difficult. It's cheerful because I'm grateful to be able to do part and be part of what God is doing in this community. He's doing stuff everywhere, but it's really cool to see what he's doing in this community, right, where we are. So let's stand together. I'm going to pray, and I'm going to invite you. We do. Uh, you can <coughs> bring it up here. You can get your phone out and do some thumb magic and send some money that way. You can give online, whatever. We take everything. <laughs> you know, I guess, you know, you could bring in some gold bullion. We'll do something with it. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you for your presence that is just blessing us in this room. God, thank you for the gift of salvation, the gift of abundant life, the gift of life itself. Thank you that we get to celebrate you today, God, with our friends, our families. And God, thank you so much for the price you paid to buy us back. We are all here redeemed because of it. Bless our gifts. Let them be multiplied, God, to touch lives and create a space for life change to happen through the power of your great love. In Jesus' name, amen. If you want to march forward, there's receptacles up here. There's one in the back. Uh, you can give online or text. All right, the lovely Laura is up here. I like candy. <laughs> I like candy a lot. We're going to wait on that for just a yes. second. This is just a teaser. Just a teaser. So March 31st. What Who is knows? it? What day is it? What day is it? Easter. Awesome. And Easter kind of goes along with what Pastor Andrew was saying. Like, we're just so grateful Amen. that he died and he rose. And that's why we're all here. That's right. Because of his sacrifice and because he rose again. So that's what we celebrate on Easter. And we want to pack the house. Yes. I mean, it's, it's pretty full in here today, but we want to pack the house even more. I'll stand back there if I need to. It's okay. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. So invite 
your friends, your family. Invite those that need to feel that resurrection power, right, right that right. we all feel today. So we're going to have some invite cards for you starting next week that you can hand out. They're going to have a QR code These on them. These invite cards, just in, in I'm just going to interrupt for a second. They're just, he likes that's to what interrupt. I do. They're just literally, <laughs> there's literally a, it's a square card that's just a QR code. And it just says, scan me. So just leave them everywhere. Because when they scan it, there's going to be a picture of me that's going to pop up. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, there isn't. But it will take them to the website, take them to some fun um, announcements and information about how many, Easter. How many of y'all have seen the past two weeks the screaming goat at the end of the video? <laughs> they will see the screaming goat. They will. They will. And they're going to want to come when they see that screaming goat. All right. But also on that day, we're going to do some fun things also. Um, this will You can use this in your invite. A little bit of peer pressure, right? Yeah. We're going to have a petting zoo. Come At on. the Life Center, after church on Easter. All right, who who has been to church on Easter and had a petting zoo? Show of hands, come on. See, oh, not very many. look at that. Come it's next, the, the Sunday after Easter, when I say that, everybody will raise their hand. <laughs> and also, happening? Pastor Andrew has a little visual aid a little today. show and tell. We're going to have a candy rain for all of our kids so what we need you to do is bring in some bags of candy. This is the candy we have so far. We need probably 100 of these. That will be like one child's worth. Yeah. We so, want them to go home and drive so their parents crazy with all the your, Easter candy. Yeah, think of your best Halloween night ever, a big pillowcase full, and we want to at least X10 or 1,000 by that, <laughs> right? We want every kid to have lots of candy. And if you've never experienced a candy rain, there's nothing like it. It's there is nothing like getting hit in the head with a dum-dum. <laughs> Nothing like it. As a kid, it's like a wonderful memory. So your kids might need to wear helmets that day. But anyway, <laughs> lots of candy. So invite and let's have an amazing Easter at the Life Center. It's going to be fantastic.
Good morning, everybody. How we doing? Y'all happy to be here today? I can feel it. Y'all look pretty. <laughs> I'm excited to be here today. Somebody asked me a few minutes ago, so does Jesus get a mention for Easter? I said, well, the hook is to get them here with the candy and the animals, and we'll bring Jesus out when they get here. How's that? Does that work? Doesn't the scripture say to compel people to come in the house by a hook or by a crook to get them here? Not crook, but you know, we got to get them here. I'm excited about this series. This will be the longest series that we've ever done. It's one year. Who's, who's down? You ready for this? I'm just, we, I've been working on this for a couple years, and I'm so excited about it. I, I think it's going to add a new dimension to us as individuals, as a church, the whole thing. I'm just pumped about it. The longest series we've done before this was 16 weeks, and that was back in 2008 or 9, something like that. But I'm excited about it, and I hope you are too. Um, I do want to mention, we're happy that Pastor Philip is with us today. He's had a, a tough week. Uh, his wife Mary passed away last Sunday, and her viewing is tomorrow. Her funeral's on Tuesday at 11, and I would ask our church community to please come out and support Pastor Philip. He's sitting here, but I will say in front of God and everybody, he is an amazing human being. And the more you get to know him, the more you get to know him, the more you realize that is just absolutely true. He leads our prime timers. And he does an amazing job with them. I know they all love him. And we have, I guarantee you, the only church in the country, maybe the world, that has a Ugandan man teaching ESL. <laughs> How cool is that? That's beautiful. Jewel told me a, a few weeks ago that they've already had two people that attend this ESL class get promotions on their job because of their grasp of English getting better in this class. That's, that's very cool, y'all. It's, it's awesome. So let's, let's kick this off today, cover to cover. We're starting in Exodus. We'll come back in the first quarter of next year and hit Genesis. How's that? All right. I'm glad you're with me. <laughs> We're going to talk about our, our title, our subtitle for today is Path to Promise. Who, who likes promises? The Bible's full of them, man. The Bible's full of promises. But what I've found that every promise in God's word is conditional. And it's not conditional upon God, it's conditional upon me because I'm the variable. He's the constant, I'm not. That's just it. And we're going to specifically focus on Israel's journey to the promised land and what that represents for us. I, I want to start today by saying the promised land for us is not heaven. Don't want to upset the apple cart today, but us trying to reach a promised land or something that equates to Israel going into their promise is, is not heaven for us. It's a place of promise, but it's a spiritual inheritance in our world where we live Every single day, it's our spiritual inheritance. It's the abundant life that Jesus promises. That's it. I've heard messages my entire life on this topic from, about Israel and where they were and how they got there, but they were, they were in a tough spot. It seems like they're always in a tough spot. You know why? Because Israel is God's chosen people. And the gates of hell want them destroyed. That's just the bottom line. They never will be, but that's, that's, what, that's what Satan wants. He wants to destroy God's people. They were in a tough spot because they were, they were in slavery. They had been enslaved for a long time. In the first quarter of next year, we're going to touch this, but a new Pharaoh had come on the scene, and in Exodus 1.8, it says, eventually a new king came to power in Egypt who knew nothing about Joseph and what he had done. And the significance of that is Joseph was a Jew. And if, if you know the story, he had been sold into slavery by his brothers. Talk about family feud. They sold him into slavery, but through slavery, through prison, through all kinds of things, he was made governor in Egypt. And he saved the Jews and the Egyptian in time of famine because how he had managed resources. So he was a hero. 
to the Egyptians and the Jews. Well, this new Pharaoh didn't know anything about what, what he didn't know who Joe was. And he had clearly earned him and the Jewish people favor with that Pharaoh at the time. And what began with Joseph and about 70 relatives had grown into a powerful and huge group of Jews. There were a bunch of Jewish people in Egypt. They had been fruitful and multiplied. It's okay to giggle there. Yes, that's, what, that's what Scripture tells us to do, be fruitful and multiply. And they took it upon themselves to do that, and they turned 70 people into a couple million. And Exodus 1 says that the new king grew worried about the number of Jews in Egypt and wondered that if there was, worried that if there was conflict, they would join Egypt's enemies and fight against them and overthrow them. So he's like, I know what we can do. Let's just make the Jews slaves. And that's what they did. They enslaved the entire Jewish population in Egypt. Fast forward hundreds of years. I think 430, something like that, is how long they were in slavery. But fast forward, Moses is there, and he's got his own miraculous story. When Moses was born, the Israelites were still rapidly reproducing. They hadn't stopped. Even being slaves, they built cities for the Egyptians. They, had, they were just still multiplying. Their numbers were growing. And Pharaoh was still worried, and he decreed that all newborn Jewish babies, the, the boys, kill them. That's harsh, y'all. Kill the babies. So Moses' mom kept him in secret for three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she put him in a waterproof basket. <laughs> and we got some cute darlings in here. I see Scarlett walking back there with her hat on. Jackson's back there. Alice is around here somewhere. I just saw Archie. There, there's babies. I love the babies. But moms, just imagine when that little darling at three months old, you get a basket and you waterproof it, and you put some blankets in there, and you hide the baby in the Nile River. Now, just for grins and giggles, I, I, re, I, I researched a little bit what kind of predators are in <laughs> the Nile River. There are 20 killer species in the Nile River, to name a few. <laughs> the crocodile. Three-month-old baby is a nice size bite for a crocodile. The Nile monitor lizard. The sand boa snake. The hippopotamus. They kill more humans in Africa than anything. The rock python. The spitting cobra. The black mamba. And the Egyptian cobra, just to name a few. That's the atmosphere that mom put the baby in to try to give him a chance to live because she knew he'd be killed otherwise. Moses was a miracle. So that was the first miracle that Moses didn't get eaten by a hippo or an alligator or spit on by a cobra or something like that. So that's the first miracle. Second miracle is that Pharaoh's daughter found him. And she's like, oh, look what I, look what I found. I found a baby. And one of, her, one of her people, one of her servants said, should I, should I go get a, a, a mom? Because she recognized he's a Jewish kid. And she said, should I get a Jewish woman to, to nurse him? She said, yes. Miracle number two, it was his mom that they found to nurse him. Fascinating story. Miracle after miracle. So Moses, being a Jew, was raised by Pharaoh's daughter, but nursed and taught by his mother. And it looks to me right here like Moses is positioned for promise right where he was. And you could, from this vantage point, you could see a path where Moses is going to grow up and have influence in the palace and the government and could possibly have led to freedom for the Jews just by himself being where he was. And God placed him in that spot where he could have had position, and he could have had power, and he could have had authority. Was that God's plan? We will never know. Possibly. But sometimes, through our actions, we force God's plan to take a circuitous route in our life, don't we? And I, I, there's no scripture for this, but I kind of believe that's what happened with Moses. I think, he was, I think God put him where he want him, and because of his actions, the plan had to change. 
Not the outcome, but the way to get there. You don't have to believe that. That's up to you. I don't care. But something happened. Moses fully understood his heritage. He understood who he was. He understood what he was. And one day he went out, and there was a Jewish person being beat by a slave master, and he looked around. Scripture says he looked around to make sure no one was watching, and he killed the dude. Premeditated murder. It came to light. Pharaoh, which it was his step-granddaddy, tried to have him killed. And what did Moses do? He ran. He ran about 700 miles to a place called Midian, which today would be northern Saudi Arabia. It's south and east of where they were in Egypt. He went there. He found a girl named Zipporah. Who are you dating, Moses? Zipporah. Years passed. They had a kid. Israel continued as slaves, and they were miserable. And Scripture says they were groaning and crying out to God. And in Exodus 2, 23 and 4, I love the phrasing of this passage. God heard their groaning. Has anybody ever groaned to God? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? That's what they were doing. They were miserable in their plight of slavery. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. That's first quarter next year. We'll talk about that. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. So God, in his infinite wisdom, says, this is still my guy. This is still my guy. You may have done some stupid things, but you're still God's person. His plan for you hasn't changed. His promise for you hasn't changed. What he wants you to do hasn't changed. So God taps Mo for the job. Maybe he was like, I already had you on the inside, and I had you picked for the job, but you went and did something stupid, and now here we are delayed a little bit. I don't know. Moses had a crazy calling experience from God, which we're going to be talking about next week, and then he hightails it back to Egypt. He goes. And with God's help, he approaches Pharaoh. He says, it's time for change, and God's people need to be released. And Pharaoh, in true narcissistic fashion, said, no, I got a good thing going on here. I got slaves. No. So the plagues happen. Y'all heard about the plagues? Water turned to blood. Pandelirium. Imagine today if our water supply turned to blood. There's not enough deer park in Sam's. (laughs) There's not enough... Purified Sam's members mark brand. It's just there's not enough if that happened. And then a plague of frogs. Who likes frogs? You wouldn't like them like that. (laughs) Who doesn't like frogs? You'd be petrified. (laughs) Frogs everywhere on everything. You open a cupboard, there's a frog. You step across the floor, there's a frog. They're on you, they're everywhere. And then comes the lice. Uh Uh-huh. At every turn, God bringing something and and Pharaoh saying, no, it's not going to happen, not going to happen. And then the flies. Who likes flies? There aren't enough fly strips that hang from the ceiling to take care of these flies. It cannot happen. Then the livestock got a plague and they started dying. And then they all got boils. Who's Who's ever had a boil? They hurt. Through all of this, The miracle in this is that through all of these plagues, God's people were not affected. Just the Egyptians. And then a hailstorm, like there had never been a hailstorm before. I had a car in a hailstorm once. It looked like popcorn had been all over. It was just ruined, horrible. And then the locusts came. This is going to be a cicada summer. Ah, it's going to be worse in the Midwest this year, but it's going to be a cicada summer. Imagine, you know, you walk out in your yard and you see they're falling on the ground. It's nasty and they're in the trees and they make noise. But imagine them everywhere and you walk out and they fly in your eyes and mouth. That's not it. And then the sun went away and it was dark. Progressively getting worse here. And the final one that finally broke the will of Pharaoh, the firstborn children in Egypt died. So Pharaoh released the Jews. They journeyed out of Egypt. Three days later, he's like, nah, this ain't happening. He chased him and caught him at the Red Sea. And that miracle happened. They crossed the Red Sea on, the Bible says, dry ground. 
And then when they went through, Pharaoh chased them in there, and the water swallowed them up. It's a journey. It's a path to promise. They were going somewhere that God had told them they were going to have. So they started walking. They came to the edge of their promise. They sent a Marine recon team out because that's what they had. And <laughs> Come on, y'all. It, it was a recon team of 12 men to see what was up in the promised land. They came back and said, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. The, gr the grape clusters are so big, you got to put them on sticks between men to carry them. It's a land that flows with milk and honey. It's paradise. It's amazing. But 10 of them were like, oh, it is. It's, all, it's everything they say, but the big old but right there. There are giants in the land. And we were like grasshoppers in their sight. Who's ever seen a really big dude or a gal and you're like, oh, man. There were giants, giants, real live giants in the land, and they felt like grasshoppers. They looked so small to them. And they said, we cannot. We cannot do it. And the voice of the ten carried more weight than the voice of the two. And they made the decision to turn around and not go into their promise because fear had spread through the camp. God hasn't given us a spirit of what? Fear. And there may be giants. I find it interesting that they were going to this promise, this land they had envisioned for centuries. They were on their way, and they were, they were right at the edge of the promise. But still, the promise wasn't perfect. It wasn't without struggle. It wasn't without conflict. It wasn't without real life situations and things they had to face and mountains they had to climb and obstacles they had to overcome and, and, and conflict they had to resolve. They were still going to have to do that, but why couldn't they believe the pillar of cloud and fire showed up in Exodus 13 before they crossed the sea in 14? They had God's GPS leading the way. They had already seen miracle after miracle, so why couldn't they believe God for the miracle that would happen once they crossed? I don't know, but it wouldn't be without conflict. Because of their decision to turn away, God made a decision too. He said, okay, if this is how you want to play it, you're not going to get it right now. And every person in the generation that has come out and said no will have to pass before I give the promise to my people. And Joshua and Caleb's generation will get that promise. A journey that would have taken, depending on who you read, 11 or 12 days to get there, took 40 years. 40 years of wandering in circles in the desert and camping and God providing food and their clothes never wearing out, miracle after miracle after miracle, just wow. So what's, what's it mean for us? What's this story? How does it apply? And, and why are we going this in depth into this? I want to talk to us today from a higher point of view, not a 30,000 foot, but not where the rubber, rubber meets the road today, just a general map for our lives, kind of. I believe we're all born with God purpose. I do. If you're alive and breathing, you have purpose in God's plan and his kingdom. Jeremiah 1.5 says, I knew, this is so cool, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Not when you were in your mother's womb, before you were even in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as prophet to the nations. Now, clearly he's talking to Jeremiah here, but this, the, the first part is a general view of how God looks at us. This tells me that God's plan for us is not reactive. God's plan that he has for each one of us in this room and watching online, it's not reactive. It is not a response to conception. Follow me. He didn't say about Jeremiah or Moses or us, oh, oh, here's a male child or here's a female child. What shall I do with him? That's, that's not what he's saying here. He's saying he knew us and he planned us and a plan for our life before conception. Before the sperm met the egg, he knew us. That's powerful and that's deep. 
Conception was just an event in a series of events that became our life. It was preemptive, implying that God specifically and specially formed this male child and all of you and all of, all of us in this room to accomplish his plan. Isn't that cool? Everybody hold your hand up. Pretend there's a mirror there. You're looking at someone that God knew before conception happened, that he planned things for you to do before you were even conceived. Does that build anyone's self-esteem a little bit? That you're not an accident, that you weren't a mistake, that you weren't somebody that doesn't matter, that God planned for you to be here on this day to hear this message? David underscores this in, in Psalm 139. Formed you with my, you, you formed my innermost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. God knows you. He knew you before you were you. Does that make sense? He planned you. He planned for you. He has a plan for your life, and it's our job, just like it was Moses' job, just like it was Jeremiah's job to submit to that plan, just like they had to, we have to. His first plan for us is that we know him. His first plan for us is salvation. Second Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. <laughs> he's had to be patient for my sake before, He's had to be long-suffering with me before and have lots of patience for me before so I could really understand God's plan for my life and stop acting like a fool. Anybody? Yeah, I thought so. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Acts 2 says the promise is for everybody. In our path, the promise begins with salvation. Our faith in Jesus, giving our life to him, being born again in baptism in his spirit. That's what happens to us, regenerates us. That's new birth, and we start following him. That's our genesis. Has God been patient with anybody in here? <laughs> I thought I might get a little response like that in the room today. God's been patient through our problems, through our trials, through our stupidity, through our foolishness. Through our full hardiness, he's been patient with us, and here we are. After salvation, he wants us in the game. Did anybody ever play a sport just to be on the team? <laughs> Was anyone content outside of these couple guys right here, Ross and Pastor Andrew, that were content just to sit on the bench and watch the game back and forth? If you were on the team and you wear the uniform and you bought the shoes that cost 150 bucks or 200 bucks and you went to the practice, you want to be in the game playing, don't you? You want to play that game. He wants us in the game. It can be summed up in what's called the Micah mandate in Micah 6, 8. No, O people, the Lord has told you what is good and this is what he requires of you. Do what's right. To love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. The walking happens after salvation. To walk humbly with our God. That's what we're going to highlight. Or even to walk with your God. Hope you, I hope you walk humbly because he's God and we're not. And he picked us up out of our junk and saved us. And none of us have a ride. And none of us are awesome or amazing. We're just sinners saved by grace. A bunch of imperfect people worshiping a perfect God. That's it. I'm on a journey with him. Fulfilling his plan as it unfolds to me. I don't know what's going to happen in five years. I know what's happening right now, and I'm walking that path as that light shines in my path. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to my feet, and I will light to my what? My path. His plan unfolds naturally as we grow in faith. His plan unfolds naturally as we grow in faith, as we mature in knowledge. That's why we're doing this cover to cover for a whole year, to increase our knowledge of God's word and to, <laughs> here's a kicker for us, and practice obedience with all that we understand. To practice obedience 
the plan that God had for Moses required obedience in some areas, some things he had to kind of even paint by numbers a little bit. As God said it, he had to do it in order to mature to the next step, in order to progress to the next step. And we have to be obedient with what we have, the knowledge we understand, to go to our next step. And as we obey God, his general plan, we begin to discover and understand his uniquely designed plan for us as individuals. Because some of you in here are good at some things, and you're not good at some things, but the person next to you will be good at things you're not good at. That's why Scripture calls us a body jointly fit. We're all members of one body, but jointly fit together to perform different functions to make it all happen. 600,000 fighting age men left Egypt, plus women and children. Number thought to believe to be around 2 million people. It wasn't a squad, y'all, or even a platoon. It was 2 million people. That's quite the operation. Moses didn't serve by himself. Think about that. The population of 2024 of the Baltimore metro area is 2.4 million people. It's like the Baltimore metro is going to travel a few hundred miles walking with tents and animals and moms and grandmoms and granddads and babies and kids and toddlers and all the stuff, dogs, cats. They picked up and they moved walking all the population of Baltimore Metro, they're traveling to their promise. Moses was not functioning by himself. It had to be tens or hundreds of thousands of people that were serving to make sure that mission could be accomplished. It was a two million person marching caravan. We read about Moses and how he got to where he did and what he did, but he wasn't the only person with purpose and calling on this trip. It took a village, and they needed all hands on deck. Some, some people born for that specific time, for that specific purpose, where God purposed to be riders and herders and builders and gatherers and cooks and horticulturists and knitters and tailors and many other things. Think about your support. Forty years they wandered around. It took a village. God needs all of us today to accomplish the mission that he has for this community at the corner of Marlin and Mirth. We're about to take some big steps, but we need everybody on board and functioning in the role that God has called you to function in. Don't let it feel like you don't matter because you do. I say this in every Next Steps class. Every job in the church is important. Every job. If you don't believe me, go in the bathroom, do your business, and realize there's no toilet paper. Somebody has to buy it. Somebody's got to put it on the roll. And if two people don't do their jobs, you are in a pickle. <laughs> it doesn't get any more real than that. We need everyone on board to do what God has called us to do on our path to promise because we're headed toward a promised land where more and more people have a relationship with Jesus and they know him and they're experiencing life change just like we have. The promised land through every stage of Israel's history, they don't, they, they don't occupy all the promised land right now. They've had to draw in and draw in. It's, it's about a third of the size of what it should be right now. Their, their nation but through every stage of their history, the promise, the conquest, the possession, the misuse, the loss, and then the recovery, it becomes so central to Israel and their covenant experience that to speak of Israel, just the land, is to speak in terms of their unique relationship with God and who they are to him. The promised land was the place that guaranteed, restored intimacy with God, and it promoted human flourishing, almost a new garden paradise. That's from the Bible Project. <laughs> Represented guaranteed, restored intimacy with God and promoted human flourishing. That sounds familiar to our new covenant, doesn't it? Our new covenant 
Israel's promised land is our abundant life promised as a result of faith in and relationship with Jesus Christ. At the beginning of the path to promise is literally, literally a decision away. Jesus, I need you. <laughs> I can't do this without you. I've tried, I failed, I messed it up so many times. My route's going like this, like an etch a sketch. I need you, Jesus. And let him begin to work in your life. Because the point of Moses' story is not his failures. And there were many. It isn't how many times he messed up. It isn't how many times he irritated God. One, at one point, the King James says that God's anger was kindled against Moses. That means he was fired up. He was irritated. He was ticked off at Moses because of his lack of faith. It isn't how many times he irritated God with his lack of faith, his inaction. It isn't the fact that he was fearful. The point is that he reached a decision point in his faith. And after that, he was all in. God's purpose, God's plan, God's will. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't feel good. I'm scared out of my mind, but it doesn't make sense, but I'm going to act because that's who God is, and he has showed up in my life. His time to that point had been tumultuous. It had detours. It had ups and downs. God, I, you cannot convince me that God's plan was for Moses to murder somebody. Didn't he later give Moses the commandments, thou shalt not kill? You can't tell me that God warned him to kill that dude, but he did. I can't believe that. But God redeemed the entire situation. In spite of Moses' mistakes, God redeemed the entire situation. Your, your life may look like it's been all over the place to hell and back to get you here. You may have been all over the place and done all sorts of things, good and not so good. doesn't matter. I don't care what you've done. God doesn't care what you've done. He wants What he cares about is what you do from here on out. Not your past, your future. You aren't finished. I don't care what stage you're in. You haven't flunked out of life. You haven't flunked out of God's plan. You haven't nullified his plan for your life. There's purpose for you. There's promise for you. There's something for you to do in this community so we can do what God wants us as a community to do. There's a plan. There's promise. All the things. And if God can work through Moses' murder, it's not often you say that, but if God can work through Moses' murder, his doubt, his fear, his disability, yeah, he had one of those too. He couldn't really talk. He stuttered like a crazy man. His reputation, anybody got one? Had one? The Bible said after Moses killed the guy, the next day he tried to give somebody some advice. and like, what, are you going to kill us too? He had a reputation. He can work through whatever you've been through, whatever you've done, and wherever you've been. Let's stand together. Worship team, prayer team, come help me. I want to tell you today that God knew you before you were known. Before you popped out, opened your eyes, screamed bloody murder because somebody slapped you on the rear end. Before you had a name, before your cord was cut, he knew you. Before you were a dividable cell, he knew you. <laughs> He's like, it's March 3rd, right? March 3rd, 2024. I want them to hear this message because they've been some places and they've experienced some things and their faith might not be as high as I need it to be. They may not realize their plan for my plan for their life like I want them to. They may not be able to see the big picture that I want to show them. I want them to be in this service. 
I want them to hear this word, and I want them to feel, to, to be emboldened and confident in my plan for life and my purpose for them and, the, and my love for them and my redemptive power that doesn't matter where they've been and what they've done. I want them to know this and feel this and hear this. I want them to put this in their gut and chew on this all week that Jesus loves me more than I could possibly imagine. And no matter how bad I've been, no matter what I've done, he's got purpose for my life that I'm going to affect someone's life in a positive way, and I'm going to see them experience the life change that he has given me. Maybe he didn't say all those words. That's, that's, that's what he wants you to know, that he loves you and that he can redeem anything. It doesn't matter. Don't let your past, your reputation, your failures, your lack of faith, your fear, a disability, preconceived ideas, things people have said about you, spoken over you. Don't let those things diminish who you are in his eyes because he saw you before you were a cell. And those eight or nine months that you were that you were growing in your mother's belly, that plan was already it was, it was already made. That you're going to be here today, and you're going to catch some vision of what's going on, and about the still thousands of people in this immediate area that need to find Jesus. And all the things you've been through, and the stuff that's happened to you. He wants to redeem. He wants to redeem and allow you to proudly, proudly, not in shame, but say, this is who I was. But Jesus loved me. This is where I was. But he loved me. This is what I used to do. But he loved me. And because he loved me, this is where I am. And because he loves you, this is where you can be. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. God made plans for you long ago. You may have taken the scenic route, but here you are. <laughs> And the most important part, here he is. You're in the right place at the right time. It's time for fate. Fate is just a, a, a cheap and easy word for God's plan. It's time for fate to take place today. For you to take your next step, whatever that is, your step, your next step of faith, and allow the promise of God's Spirit, His abundant life, and a life, your life, a promise to find their way into your life. And here's what I will promise you if you will, He will. What's, what's the Chronicles say? If my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. The promise is for everybody. It's what Acts 39 says. The promise is for everybody. Our path to it begins right now. From wherever you are, you have a next step to take. I encourage you today to take that next step. Our prayer team is here. We're going to pray. They're going to sing. I invite you to come take a step of faith and walk out here and let us pray with you about your next step, whatever that is, whatever need you have. Let us agree together in prayer and see God do something amazing, amazing in your life. Let's pray.